and welcome to Back to the Book. It's time to relax and enjoy some of the finest literature ever written in English. Welcome back to Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. If you're sitting comfortably, I'll begin at chapter 5, Old Letters. I have often noticed that almost everyone has his own individual small economies, careful habits of saving fractions of pennies in some one particular direction, any disturbance of which annoys him more than spending shillings or pounds on some real extravagance. An old gentleman of my acquaintance, who took the intelligence of the failure of a joint stock bank, in which some of his money was invested with stoical mildness, worried his family all through a long summer's day, because one of them had torn, instead of cutting, out the written leaves of his now useless bank book. Of course, the corresponding pages at the other end came out as well, and this little unnecessary waste of paper, his private economy, chafed him more than all the loss of his money. Envelopes fretted his soul terribly when they first came in. The only way in which he could reconcile himself to such waste of his cherished article was by patiently turning inside out all that was sent to him, and so making them serve again. Even now, though tamed by age, I see him casting willful glances at his daughters when they send a whole instead of a half sheet of note paper, with the three lines of acceptance to an invitation written on only one of the sides. I am not above owning that I have this human weakness myself. String is my foible. My pockets get full of little hanks of it, picked up and twisted together, ready for uses that never come. I am seriously annoyed if anyone cuts the string of a parcel instead of patiently and unfaithfully and doing it fold by fold. How people can bring themselves to use Indian rubber rings, which are a sort of deification of string, as likely as they do, I cannot imagine. To me, an Indian rubber ring is a precious treasure. I have one which is not new, one that I picked up off the floor nearly six years ago. I've really tried to use it, but my heart failed me and I could not commit the extravagance. Small pieces of butter grieve others. They cannot attend to conversation because of the annoyance occasioned by the habit which some people have of invariably taking more butter than they want. Have you not seen the anxious look, almost mesmeric, which such persons fix on the article? They would feel it a relief if they might bury it out of their sight by popping it into their own mouths and swallowing it down, and they are really made happy if the person on whose plate it lies unused suddenly breaks off a piece of toast, which he does not want at all, and it eats up his butter. They think that this is not waste. Now, Miss Matty Jenkins was chary of candles. We had many devices to use as few as possible. In the winter afternoons, she would sit knitting for two or three hours, she could do this in the dark or by firelight, and when I asked if I might not ring for candles to finish stitching my wristbands, she told me to keep blind man's holiday. They were usually brought in with tea, but we only burnt one at a time, as we lived in constant preparation for a friend who might come in any evening, but who never did. It required some contrivance to keep our two candles of the same length, ready to be lighted, and to look as if we always burnt two. The candles took it in turns, and whatever we might be talking about or doing, Miss Matty's eyes were habitually fixed upon the candle, ready to jump up and extinguish it, and to light the other before they became too uneven in length to be restored to equality in the course of the evening. One night, I remember that this candle economy particularly annoyed me. I had been very much tired of my compulsory blind man's holiday, especially as Miss Matty had fallen asleep and I did not like to stir the fire and run the risk of awakening her. So I could not even sit on the rug and scorch myself with sewing by firelight, according to my usual custom. I fancied Miss Matty must be dreaming of her early life, for she spoke one or two words in her uneasy sleep, bearing reference to persons who were dead long before. When Martha brought in the lighted candle and tea, Miss Matty started into wakefulness, with a strange, bewildered look around, as if we were not the people she expected to see about her. There was a little sad expression that shadowed her face as she recognised me, but immediately afterwards she tried to give me her usual smile. All through tea time, her talk ran upon the days of her childhood and youth, 
Perhaps this reminded her of the desirableness of looking over all the old family letters and destroying such as ought not to be allowed to fall into the hands of strangers. For she had often spoken of the necessity of this task, but had always shrunk from it with a timid dread of something painful. Tonight, however, she rose up after tea and went for them, in the dark, for she piqued herself on the precise neatness of all her chamber arrangements, and used to look uneasily at me when I lighted a bed candle to go to another room for anything. When she returned, there was a faint, pleasant smell of Tonquin beans in the room. I'd always noticed this scent about any of the things which had belonged to her mother, and many of the letters were addressed to her, yellow bundles of love letters, sixty or seventy years old. Miss Matty undid the packet with a sigh, but she stifled it directly, as if it were hardly right to regret the flight of time, or of life either. We agreed to look over them separately, each taking a different letter out of the same bundle and describing its contents to the other before destroying it. I never knew what sad work the reading of old letters was before that evening, though I could hardly tell why. The letters were as happy as letters could be, at least those early letters were. There was in them a vivid and intense sense of the present time, which seemed so strong and full, as if it could never pass away, and as if the warm living hearts that so expressed themselves could never die and be as nothing to the sunny earth. I should have felt less melancholy, I believe, if the letters had been more so. I saw the tears quietly stealing down the well-worn furrows of Miss Matty's cheeks, and her spectacles often wanted wiping. I trust at last that she would light the other candle, for my own eyes were rather dim, and I wanted more light to see the pale, faded ink. But no, even through her tears, she saw and remembered her little economical ways. The earliest set of letters were two bundles tied together, and ticketed in Miss Jenkins' handwriting. Letters interchanged between my ever-honoured father and my dearly beloved mother prior to their marriage in July 1774. I should guess that the rector of Cranford was about 27 years of age when he wrote those letters, and Miss Matty told me that her mother was just 18 at the time of her wedding. With my idea of the rector, derived from a picture in the dining parlour, stiff and stately, in a huge full-bottomed wig, with gown, cassock and bands, and in his hand upon a copy of the only sermon he ever published. It was strange to read these letters. They were full of eager, passionate ardour, short, homely sentences, right fresh from the heart, very different from the grand Latinized Johnsonian style of the printed sermon preached before some judge at assize time. His letters were a curious contrast to those of his girl bride, she was evidently rather annoyed at his demands for, upon her for expressions of love and could not quite understand what he meant by repeating the same thing over in so many different ways. But what she was quite clear about was her longing for a white poudissoy, whatever that might be, and six or seven letters were principally occupied in asking her lover to use his influence with her parents, who evidently kept her in good order, to obtain this or that article of dress, more especially the white Pudasoy. He cared nothing how she dressed. She was always lovely enough for him, as he took pains to assure her, when she begged him to express in his answers a predilection for particular pieces of finery, in order that she might show what he said to her parents. But at length he seemed to find out that she would not be married till she had a trousseau in her mind, and then he sent her a letter, which was evidently accompanied a full box of finery, in which he requested that she might be dressed in everything her heart desired. This was the first letter, ticketed in a frail, delicate hand. From my dearest John. Shortly afterwards they were married, I suppose, from the intermission in their correspondence. We must burn them, I think, said Miss Matty, looking doubtfully at me. No one will care for them when I am gone. And one by one she dropped them into the middle of the fire, watching each blaze up, die out, and rise away, in faint, white, ghostly semblance, up the chimney, before she gave her nether to the same fate. The room was light enough now, but I, like her, was fascinated into watching the destruction of those letters, into which the honest warmth of a manly heart had been poured forth. The next letter, likewise docketed by Miss Jenkins, was endorsed, 
Letter of pious congratulation and exhortation from my venerable grandfather to my mother on occasion of my own birth. Also some practical remarks on the desirability of keeping warm the extremities of infants from my excellent grandmother. The first pass was, indeed, a severe and forcible picture of the responsibilities of mothers and a warning against the evils that were in the world and laying in ghastly wait for the little baby of two days old. His wife did not write, said the old gentleman, because he had forbidden it, she being indisposed with a sprained ankle, which, he said, quite incapacitated her from holding a pen. However, at the foot of the page was a small T-O, and on turning over, sure enough, there was a letter to my dearest, dearest Molly, begging her, when she left her room, whatever she did, to go upstairs before going down, and telling her to wrap her baby's feet up in flannel and keep it warm by the fire, although it was summer, for babies were so tender. It was pretty to see from the letters, which were evidently exchanged with some frequency between the young mother and the grandmother, how the girlish vanity was being weeded out of her heart by love for her baby. The white padasoy figured again in the letters, with almost as much vigour as before. In one, it was being made into a christening cloak for the baby. It decked it when it went out with its parents to spend a day or two at Arley Hall. It added to its charms when it was the prettiest little baby that ever was seen. Dear mother, I wish you could see her. Without any partiality, I do think she will grow into a regular beauty. I thought of Miss Jenkins, grey, withered and wrinkled, and I wondered if her mother had known in the courts of heaven, and then I knew that she had, and that they stood there in angelic guise. There was a great gap before any of the rector's letters appeared, and then his wife had changed her mode of endorsement. It was no longer from, My dearest John, it was from, my honoured husband. The letters were written on occasion of the publication of the same sermon which was represented in the picture. The preaching before my Lord Judge and the publishing by request was evidently the culminating point, the event of his life. It had been necessary for him to go up to London to superintend it through the press. Many friends had to be called upon and consulted before he could decide on any printer fit for so onerous a task and at length it was arranged that J and J Rivingtons were to have the honourable responsibility. The worthy rector seemed to be strung up by the occasion into a high literary pitch, for he could hardly write a letter to his wife without cropping out into Latin. I remember the end of one of his letters ran thus. I shall ever hold the virtuous qualities of my Molly in remembrance. Dem mero ipsi me, dem spiritus regit artus which, considering that the English of his correspondent was sometimes at fault in grammar and often in spelling, might be taken as a proof of how much he idolised his Molly, and, as Miss Jenkins used to say, People talk a great deal about idolising nowadays, whatever that may mean. But there was nothing to the fit of writing classical poetry which soon seized him, in which his Molly figured away as Maria. The letter containing the Carmen was endorsed by her, Hebrew verses sent to me by my honoured husband. I thought to have had a letter about killing the pig, but must wait. Remember, to send the poetry to Sir Peter Arley, as my husband desires. And in a postscript note to in his handwriting, it was stated that the ode had appeared in the Gentleman's Magazine, December 1782. Her letters back to her husband, treasured as fondly by him as if they had been M. T. Chironius Epistolae, were more satisfactory to an absent husband and father than could his ever have been to her. She told him how Deborah sewed her seam very neatly every day, and read to her in the books he would set her, how she was a very forward good child, but would ask questions her mother could not answer, and how she did not let herself down by saying she did not know, but took to stirring the fire, or sending the forward child on an errand. Matty was now the mother's darling. I was reading this aloud to Miss Matty, who smiled and sighed a little at the hope, so fondly expressed that little Matty might not be vain, even if she were a beauty. I had very pretty hair, my dear, said Miss Matilda, and not a bad mouth. And I saw her soon afterwards adjust her cap and draw herself up. But to return to Mrs Jenkins' letters. 
She told her husband about the poor in the parish, what homely domestic medicine she had administered, what kitchen physic she had sent. She had evidently held his displeasure as a rod in pickle over the heads of all the ne'er-do-wells. She asked for his directions about the cows and pigs, and did not always obtain them, as I should have shown before. The kind old grandmother was dead when the little boy was born, soon after the publication of the sermon, but there was another letter of exhortation from the grandfather, more stringent and admonitory than ever, now that there was a boy to be guarded from the snares of the world. He described all the various sins into which men might fall, until I wondered how any man ever came to a natural death. The gallows seemed as if they must have been the termination of the lives of most of the grandfather's friends and acquaintance, and I was not surprised at the way in which he spoke of this life being a veil of tears. It seemed curious that I should never have heard of this brother before, but I concluded that he had died young, or else surely his name would have been alluded to by his sisters. By and by, we came to packets of Miss Jenkins' letters. These Miss Matty did regret to burn, she said all the others had been only interesting to those who loved the writers, and that it seemed as it would have hurt her to allow them to fall into the hands of strangers who had not known her dear mother and how good she was, although she did not always quite spell in the modern fashion. But Deborah's letters were so very superior. Anyone might profit by reading them. It was a long time since she had read Mrs. Chaperon, but she knew she used to think that Deborah could have said the same things quite as well. And as for Mrs. Carter... People thought a deal of her letters, just because she had written Actinius, but she was quite sure Deborah would never have made use of such a common expression as, I canna be fashed. Miss Matty did grudge burning these letters, it was evident. She would not let them be carelessly passed over with any quiet reading and skipping to myself. She took them from me, and even lighted the second candle in order to read them aloud with a proper emphasis and without stumbling over the big words. Oh dear, how I wanted facts instead of reflections before those letters were concluded. They lasted us two nights, and I won't deny that I made use of the time to think of many other things, and yet I was always at my post at the end of each sentence. The rector's letters, and those of his wife and mother-in-law, had all been tolerably short and pithy, written in a straight hand, with the lines very close together. Sometimes the whole letter was contained on a mere scrap of paper. The paper was very yellow and the ink very brown. Some of the sheets were, as Miss Matty made me observe, the old original post with the stamp in the corner, representing a postboy riding for life and twanging his horn. The letters of Mrs Jenkins and her mother were fastened with a great round red wafer, for it was before Mrs Edward's patronage had banished wafers from polite society. It was evident, from the tenor of what was said, that franks were in great request, and were even used as a means of paying debts by needy members of Parliament. The rector sealed his epistles with an immense coat of arms, and showed by the care with which he had performed this ceremony that he expected they should be cut open, not broken by any thoughtless or impatient hand. Now, Mrs. Jenkins' letters were of a later date in form and writing. She wrote on the square sheet, which we have learnt to call old-fashioned. Her hand was admirably calculated, together with her use of many syllabled words, to fill up a sheet, and then came the pride and delight of crossing. Poor Miss Matty got sadly puzzled with this, for the words gathered sighs like snowballs, and towards the end of the letter, Miss Jenkins used to become quite septuquidillion. It won to her father, slightly theological and controversial in its tone. She had spoken of Herod, Tetrarch of Udima. Miss Matty read it. Herod, Petrarch of Etruria, and was just as well pleased as if she had been right. I can't quite remember the date, but I think it was in 1805 that Miss Jenkins wrote the longest series of letters on occasion of her absence on a visit to some friends near Newcastle-upon-Tyne. These friends were intimate with the commandant of the garrison there, and heard from him of all the preparations that were being made to repel the invasion of Bonaparte, which some people imagined might take place at the mouth of the Tyne. 
Miss Jenkins was evidently very much alarmed, and the first part of her letters was often written in pretty intelligible English, conveying particulars of the preparations which were made in the family with whom she was residing against the dreaded event. The bundles of clothes that were packed up, ready for a flight to Alston Moor, a wild hilly piece of ground between Northumberland and Cumberland, the signal that was to be given for this flight, and the simultaneous turning out of the volunteers under arms, which said signal was to consist, if I remember rightly, in ringing the church bells in a particular and ominous manner. One day, when Miss Jenkins and her hosts were at a dinner party in Newcastle, this warning summons was actually given, not a very wise proceeding, if there be any truth in the moral attached to the fable of the boy and the wolf, but so it was. And Miss Jenkins, hardly recovered from her fright, wrote the next day to describe the sound, the breathless shock, the hurry and alarm, and then, taking breath, she added, How trivial, my dear father, do all, all our apprehensions of the last evening appear, at the present moment, to calm and inquiring minds. But here Miss Matty broke in with, But indeed, my dear, they were not at all trivial or trifling at the time. I know I used to wake up in the night many a time and think I heard the tramp of the French entering Cranford. Many people talked of hiding themselves in the salt mines, and meat would have been kept capitally down there, only perhaps we should have been thirsty. And my father preached a whole set of sermons on the occasion, one set in the mornings all about David and Goliath, to spirit up the people to fighting with spades and bricks if needed were, and the other set in the afternoon, proving that Napoleon was another name for Boney, as we used to call him, was all the same as Napoleon and Abaddon. I remember my father rather thought he should be asked to print this last set, but the parish had perhaps had enough of them with hearing. Peter Marmaduke Arley Jenkins, poor Peter, as Miss Matty began to call him, was at school at Shrewsbury at this time. The rector took up his pen and rubbed up his Latin once more to correspond with his boy. It was very clear that the lads were what were called slow letter, show letters. They were of a highly mental description, giving an account of his studies and his intellectual hopes of various kinds, with an occasional quotation from the classics. But now and then the animal nature broke out in such little sentence as this, evidently written in a trembling hurry after the letter had been inspected. Mother dear, do send me a cake and put plenty of citron in it. The mother dear probably answered her boy in the form of cakes and goody, for there were none of her letters among this set, but a whole collection of the rectors, to whom the Latin in his boy's letters was like a trumpet to an old war horse. I do not know much about Latin, certainly, and it is perhaps an ornamental language, but not very useful, I think, at least to judge from the bits I remember out of the rector's letters. One was, You have not got that town in your map of Ireland, but... Bonus bedardus don vide omnia, as the proverbia say. Presently it became very evident that poor Peter got himself into many scrapes. There were letters of stilted penitence to his father for some wrongdoing, and among them all was a badly written, badly sealed, badly directed, blotted note. My dear, 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 dearest mother, I will be a better boy, I will indeed, but please don't be ill for me, I am not worth it. But I will be good, darling mother. Miss Matty could not speak for crying after she had read this note. She gave it to me in silence and then got up and took it to her sacred recesses in her own room for fear by any chance it might get burned. Poor Peter, she said. He was always in scrapes. He was too easy. They led him wrong and then left him in the lurch. But he was too fond of mischief. He could never resist a joke. Poor Peter. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying Cranford, do join me again next time. And I look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye.